Hello, and welcome to today's panel discussion on Inspiring and Replicable Models, which is part of the Transition US Online Summit. My name is Marissa Momarts. I'm part of the Transition US team, and I have the honor of hosting our panel today. I hope you've enjoyed hearing from some of the luminaries in the transition movement and are ready to hear from local transition leaders across the country about what transition looks like in their communities. I'd like to start by welcoming our guests. We have Janet Lewis of Transition Sarasota, Florida, Linda Curry of Transition Berkeley, California, Sabita Green of the Winnesheek Idea House in Decorah, Iowa, and Ginkgo Lee um, of Transition Pasadena Repair Cafe, and Ginkgo's currently living in Taiwan. So thank you for joining us um, from a totally different time zone. Mm -hmm. The purpose of this panel is to share models for a handful of projects that local transition initiatives and other community resilience groups have found to be especially inspiring and successful at making change in their own local communities. Projects that can easily be replicated in other places. Practical on the ground projects are an important part of transition because they help people see and feel what's possible, bringing to life our positive vision of the future. All of the projects you'll hear about today share some of the central themes of transition like building community, reducing waste and consumerism, shrinking our carbon footprint and alleviating our dependence on fossil fuels, making our communities more resilient. And participants have a lot of fun doing them, as you'll hear. So with that, let's dive in. First, each of our presenters will give a brief overview of their project, and then I'll be asking them some follow-up questions. First, we'll hear from Janet Lewis, from the Transition Sarasota Suncoast Gleaning Project, a model for reducing food waste while getting healthy food to those who need it. Over to you, Janet. All right, Marissa, thank you so much for having me here today. It's great to be able to participate in this. And I'm just getting my, my um, presentation up. So, Marissa mentioned that I'm talking about the Suncoast Gleaning Project, and this is with Transition Sarasota, which is located in Sarasota, Florida. Firstly, what is gleaning? A lot of people don't know what gleaning is and have not done gleaning, but the, the principle of gleaning is collecting leftover crops from farmers' fields after they've been commercially harvested or on fields where it's not economically profitable to harvest. So essentially we're working to capture what would be wasted. This is gonna be the ninth season. We're gonna be starting our ninth season this fall with the Suncoast Gleaning Project. And we have a long standing partnerships with Jessica's Organic Farm and All Face Food Bank. And these partnerships are really key to the success of this program. At the beginning of each siege, then we have all volunteers sign a waiver. And our gleaning day is typically on Monday. And I point this out because this is one of the carry, this is one of the aspects of this project that makes it work really well. If you look at this sign from Jessica's stand, you'll see that the market days are on the weekend. And so the way that this works is because the farmer is selling the produce on the weekend, what, ha what has already been harvested but has not sold by the end of the day Sunday is good produce to be collected and sent to the food bank on Monday, along with other produce that wasn't harvested over the weekend, but it's going to be too old or not in the best condition for the following farm stand. So that's the dynamics of this farm stand. So this is the way that the, that the week works. On Sunday, the gleaning coordinator checks with the farmer about the gleaning needs and communicates that to the volunteers by email and Facebook so that they're aware that they need to come, do they need to come, what's the harvest going to be like, temperatures, and, and so forth. And on Monday in the morning, the gleaning coordinator arrives a little early and does a walkthrough with the farmer and then the volunteers gather and they start organizing the leftover produce from the weekend farm stand. Instructions are provided for harvesting. 
and then the harvest is done and there's a there's a flow of work from harvesting to cleaning to packaging and those are going on fairly simultaneously people bring in the harvest the produce gets cleaned and we have packaging going on so we have people in different stations one of the great benefits of this program is that volunteers get to take home a bag of produce now this is fantastic organic fresh produce it's really delicious it's very nutritious you've got all these vegetables and this helps to ensure that our volunteers are also food secure that they're not just putting in time but they also get benefit out of this and they're also developing community for themselves which is a fantastic thing after after all the produce has gone through then all face picks up picks up um, the, the the produce that's been packaged so here we have some fields of some, some pictures of people in the field you can see we're harvesting into black bins they have a pretty good time out there we're in florida we have a lot of nice weather which is fortunate and we've also seen um, students come through so this is one of the high schools the out of door academy and we have a, had a bunch of teenagers come in one day and so it was great to have them come in their their parents signed the waiver forms ahead of time and they could come in and experience this for themselves and learn how to be more sustainable in the community and what was happening sustainably in the community we have a lot of different types of produce that we harvest here's an image of the of the cleaning stand so depending on the produce it may or may not need to get washed it gets repackaged, put onto pallets, and then saran wrap is used to stabilize the produce on the pallets because the, the person from All Face Food Bank is coming with a really large truck. They're going to be using a forklift to get that produce onto the truck, and so we need it to be nice and stable. And then All Face is going to take that to their warehouse where they're going to then from there redistribute to distribution sites. And that is the essentials of how the gleaning project works, the Suncoast Gleaning Project. Thank you so much. And it's back to you. Wonderful. Thank you, Janet. Next, we'll hear from Ginka Lee from the Transition Pasadena Repair Cafe, a project that builds community and reduces waste and consumerism by encouraging people to repair rather than replace their older damaged items. The Repair Cafe model originated in the Netherlands and is spreading around the world. At least seven transition initiatives in the U.S. have already hosted Repair Cafes. And with that, I will turn it over to you, Ginkgo. And you are still on mute, by the way. Hold on, I have a little bit technical difficulty in here getting to my text. Okay, here. Oh, thank you for having me. So I'm Ginko from Transition Pasadena. So among, we have a lot of different projects and Repair Cafe has been one of the really long running projects that we have. Um, so the, the one we have has been going on for six years and over 50 events. Uh, the way we do it is that it's a pop-up uh, event, uh, event that travel around the city. Um, we help people to repair all sorts of stuff. Uh, we repair small appliances, clothing, jewelry, shopping knives, bikes, computers, and a lot more. Um, so maybe you can see in the graphics some of the um, very various activities at Repair Cafe. Sometimes we even have haircut, um, massage that repair people's body. And there's always a plant expert to talk about your garden. Um, so right now, each event we will have about 50 volunteers, 30 of them would have special skills for repair, but uh, the 20 of them is actually doing administrative tasks and keep the whole thing running. So we feel very important that the whole uh, event run very smoothly, so nobody being, uh, have, having to wait for too long. Um, another thing I think is kind of uh, a special is that um, it's often a two-way street by the guy who is repairing people's toaster oven or also have a pair of pants that being repaired. So it's kind of a circular 
uh, helping each other thing, and it's, it's a lot of fun. Uh, I think this project, as far as the impact, um, some of them are very subtle. I think it makes Pasadena a more pro-environment place to live. The city feel more connected because there's a lot of different groups participate at Repair Cafe. And sometimes I find it's difficult to be an environmentalist or activist who work on various projects on the political level and feeling they're always banking their head to the wall. So I feel that Repair Cafe is a, always a very happy community place that is like a recharge station for our activists in the city. Um, so they get to come to be with the community, have some fun, and before they get back there, fight for social good and for our environment. So uh, Repair Cafe serve that function for our community. Also, another interesting aspect is that Repair Cafe has become a very good platform for us to spread environmental practice. Like one of the another transitioned uh, Pasadena project is called the Green Circle, uh, which helped us transform Repair Cafe into a zero waste event that we don't use any single used um, cups or plate. And then so this group is kind of building and building within Repair Cafe. And then now they go out to the local farmer's market to help that event to become zero waste. And also they uh, have been going to different events to spread the zero waste uh, practices uh, to daily life. So uh, I think that's something that go out of Repair Cafe organically that happens over the year. Um, so the most inspiring statistic I think is that uh, we have been going over six years, 50 events and almost zero budget. And um, the number that I'm most proud of is that we have about 200 repeated volunteers coming um, and still coming back continuously. Uh, it is a very popular event, so we don't worry too much about attracting enough crowd. We have about 75 to 150 people uh, uh, show up every event. Um, we are very dedicated to keep our volunteers happy. Uh, so that it can go on for a long, long time. So um, in, instead of the, the number of repair, which is about 100 per event, I think the 200 volunteer is the one that I'm most proud about. And um, as Marisa said, it started at the Netherlands and uh, on the 2012, we see a article at New York Times and our local transition Pasadena founder, Therese Bummo, actually wrote up her sleeve, uh, made a few phone calls to local Time Bank member. And then we have been pretty blessed uh, where we see since then. So uh, counting and uh, we, uh, uh, right now, I'm, I leave the project, but we have 12 core volunteers to continue uh, trans, uh, uh, the Repair Cafe in Pasadena. So that's about it. Great. Thank you, Ginkgo. That's very inspiring. Um, and next, we'll hear, we'll hear from Tabita Green of the Winnesheek Idea House in Decorah, Iowa. Um, which is a model for catalyzing community members to support the creation of resilience building businesses and ultimately transform the local economy. Over to you, Tabita. All right, well, thanks so much for having me. I'm excited to uh, share about Winshik Idea House and, and learn from the others on this panel. So to start off, um, we've only one, done one of these and we started planning in the early fall of 2017. Three of my friends and I, we just uh, were inspired by the local entrepreneur forum in Totnes, UK. Uh, if you haven't heard of that, think crowdfunding in real time. And our goal was to facilitate local impact investing in sustainable local businesses that contribute in some way to strengthening our local economy and making our community more resilient. So we also connected with the local economic development office in our county, which is Winnesheek County and added a fifth person to our committee, which is the director of that organization. 
uh, we decided to call the event uh, Winnishik Idea House, which we defined as a meeting of the minds and a space for local entrepreneurs to share their needs with a supportive community. Next slide, please. Throughout that fall, we planted seeds about the event by hosting an asset mapping slash idea generation session with community leaders, and that's where that flip chart is from. And we also put out a call uh, for entrepreneurs through traditional and social media. 15 entrepreneurs uh, applied to pitch ideas at Winnishik Idea House, and we ended up selecting five of them. The selected entrepreneurs worked with business coaches from the Iowa Small Business Development Center to prepare their presentations and also worked with a local theater person to uh, help with their presentation skills. We promoted the event in all sorts of different ways by email lists, on Facebook, of course, uh, in the newspaper, on community calendars, we were on the radio, and we also sent uh, personal invitations to about 100 community leaders and supporters of the new economy. Uh, and then we also asked our entrepreneurs to make sure that they got their networks to the event uh, to support them. And then we encouraged everybody who was planning to attend to register online and make a small donation to cover the expenses. And next slide, please. And so on March 23rd, we welcomed over 150 community members from diverse walks of life uh, into the Decora Elks Lodge for our first annual Winnishik Idea House. Uh, the event spanned four hours and included the main following parts. Uh, we had a happy hour slash networking session at the beginning, and then we did um, a business idea sharing for local entrepreneurs using the ProAction Cafe model, and that's what's shown in this picture. Uh, then we had more networking and food, of course, and also a need an offers wall that you can see back at the end of this and then finally we had our trout tank which was the pitching session and this is named for our great trout fishing that we have around here next slide please so during the trout tank each entrepreneur pitched for five minutes and answered clarifying questions from the audience and then our MC facilitated pledges from the audience in support of the pitched idea it was a little bit slow to get people to uh, pipe up at first, but people caught on pretty quickly. Uh, one thing we did find was that entrepreneurs who provided more concrete areas for support, like planting trees or pre-buying backpacks, uh, received more support than entrepreneurs whose needs were a little bit less specific. Uh, the energy room was the energy in the room was really high, and each entrepreneur received a lot of enthusiasm, so that was exciting. And at one point, there was even a spontaneous auction that emerged uh, as several attendees were really keen on getting the first backpack from Cody, one of our entrepreneurs, and it ended up uh, selling for $500. Um, and after the event, we collected pledge sheets from the attendees and created a spreadsheet for each entrepreneur with all the contact information and the pledges that they received from the attendees. And then it was up to them to follow up and make arrangements for you know, personal loans and things like that after the event. Next slide, please. And so the impact of this first event was that 44 attendees made a total of 156 pledges uh, to support our five entrepreneurs. And this included over $7,000 in donations and patient loans. Um, and 30 commitments to support the businesses in various ways, 21 contributions of volunteer work for those businesses, and unlimited enthusiasm. And this is the bar where we ended up after the event uh, to celebrate the first Winnishik ID House. So that's what I have, so back to you. Wonderful, thank you so much. Um, and finally, we're gonna hear from Linda Curry from Transition Berkeley, who's gonna talk about Transition Streets, um, which is a model for strengthening neighborhoods by providing practical steps for people to make their lifestyles and homes healthier, more sustainable, and resilient. Over to you, Linda. Hi, everybody. I'm really excited to be on this panel to tell you about Transition Streets and my experience in Berkeley. Next slide, please. So just what is Transition Streets? It's a project that brings neighbors together to take practical actions and to build community resilience and to reduce energy and water use. 
It's guided by a handbook with chapters on energy, water, food, waste, transportation, and next steps. And it's really great because it's replicable and easy to use, and it does build stronger neighborhoods and also helps us respond to climate change. So this um, photo that you see here on the right is uh, the Transition Streets group in my neighborhood. We named ourselves West Bray Neighbors. And this was part of a pilot program in 2015 that we participated in. We had um, seven households participating. Some of the people in the neighborhood had been there a long time and then others were newer. And none of us knew each other very well. So when we first started meeting, it was a little bit awkward. Uh, not tense, but just tentative. And um, as we you know, shared food in the beginning and got to know each other better, um, it really became more like a party than a meeting. It was, um, uh, the, the chapters were great. They're very clear and succinct and a great starting place to get us going and sparked a lot of conversation and motivation. Uh, it was really surprising how much knowledge and expertise we had to share with each other. We know uh, that our climate is changing uh, due to our current lifestyle and use of fossil fuels. And most of us really have a desire to do something about it, but we're not sure exactly what to do or if our personal actions will make a difference. And it turns out that actually small actions do, uh, by many, um, does create big impact leading to larger and even institutional change. The Transition Streets program provides a great way to get started and it's really, really enjoyable. And the impact in my neighborhood has been great and lasting. There's been just a lot more uh, sharing of ideas, sharing of veggies and tools, converted lawns, socializing, block parties, and a feeling of connectedness that we hadn't had before. Next, please. So a little bit about the background of Transition Streets. It actually began in the UK in 2010, and there were about 550 households that participated across the country there. They found that um, they were saving a lot of carbon pollution, roughly 1.3 tons, and money on energy bills. And that was really phenomenal, it was nine, just under $1,000 there. Um, so uh, Trans Transition US decided to adapt the program for our US audience. And in 2015, we, um, we did pilot programs here in the US, and then there was a national launch in 2016. Next, please. So here's a map showing uh, from the website actually showing transition streets groups across the country and it was so exciting to be on calls as we were developing the, the pilot uh, with some of these folks so if you do the program you might get on the map <laughs> next please how does the program work it's it's very well organized and really inspiring first um, get familiar with the program go to transitionstreets.org look at the materials, download them, then invite your neighbors to participate. And it only takes a few, um, handful, like maybe five to 10. Um, meet for seven sessions, that's how many chapters there are. Take action, each session requires actions and help each other along the way. And then at the end there's a eva evaluation and um, then you get to celebrate. So, um, and then you get to see the results after that, uh, along the way, but also afterwards, it's on, ongoing. So what you see there is a photograph I took of my neighbor's yard just a few days ago. Um, they had uh, transformed it from being just scrubby grass that, you know, it's all dry from the drought to this wonderful landscape with um, succulents and you can't see it there, but there's lots of vegetables, there's an apple tree, and um, it's just so, so beautiful now. So next, please. Small, thoughtful actions can change the world. Studies actually show that just 10% of the population needs to get behind something for great change to happen. So if you'd like to learn more, um, I encourage you to check it out at transitionstreets.org or you can contact me for more information. Thank you so much. 
Great, thank you, Linda. And that was really inspiring to hear from all of you. Um, now we're gonna dig a little bit deeper and I have some um, questions or invitations for each of you. The first is just to share a story that captures the spirit of your project in just one to two minutes. Um, so we're gonna start this time with Ginkgo. And you are on mute right now. So if you can un unmute yourself or Don can unmute you. Okay, sorry about that. There you go, no worries. One of the story I want to share is that um, uh, um, generosity is contagious. Uh, Repair Cafe um, has so many people coming. So that's one particular guy, uh, Mr. A. And he, when he first come, he would just come in Repair Cafe. There's a lot of free things for ticking. So he get repair and uh, get a lot of free stuff and then just uh, tick and tick and tick. So when you have a lot of volunteer giving, so um, sometimes this happen. So we kind of have a meeting uh, among ourselves. But after he come for two times, I know that he take the bus to come to Repair Cafe. And then the third time he start to uh, repairing a bicycle for other people. So I feel that there's a lot of time that um, instead of talking, uh, creating the environment, that when people get to the environment and they would uh, have some different way of seeing the world and have some change. So I, this is one of the story in the Repair Cafe that is really deep in my heart and I, I'm really happy that that happened. That gave me goosebumps. <laughs> okay, Tavita, over to you. Yeah, I'll, uh, I'll share a personal story from Winshike Dia House. Um, one of our featured entrepreneurs was Hannah Breckbill, uh, who uh, is a farmer at Humble Hands Harvest, which is an organic vegetable farm cooperative in our area. And I ended up personally supporting her at the chop tank in a few different ways. Um, one of those ways was uh, buying a market share from her. And that means that every time I go to the farmer's market, um, I get to see her or her business partner, Emily, um, you know, when I'm picking up my carrots and my onions and my lettuce and my squash and so on. Um, and not only does Hannah sustain me and my family with her farming, but we're also members of a community organizations together and we see each other around town. And so there's a good deal of trust between us. And I think that's a really core uh, aspect of making something like Winnishik Idea House uh, a success. And several weeks ago, I received an email from her and it said, um, way back in March, you offered a patient loan for us to put up a pole building. Well, we're really excited that it's happening this month and we'll need to pay for it. And uh, so she was ready for her loan and uh, Hannah and I emailed back and forth a couple of times to set the terms for the loan. And then I wrote a check and dropped it off the next time I visited the farmer's market. And it was a very exciting moment to have that happen. And several of my friends also lent money for the pole building and each of them expressed the same joy over uh, writing that check and then you know, being able to support Humble Hands in that very intimate way. And the good news is that now the building is up and Hannah and Emily have a place on their farm to store things and also a roof to put solar panels on, which is very exciting. And I guess the bigger point of this is that this is just my own experience, but think about that story multiplied many, many, many times over in a community. And I think that's really the kind of community building and mutual support that we're hoping to expand uh, with this project. Sounds like you need a barn warming party. <laughs> yeah, I think that's probably in the plants. <laughs> Linda, over to you. So I found that every meeting that we had, each chapter, um, people got sparked about different aspects. And um, one, one chapter that was really exciting to people was the one on transportation. And uh, this, this participant in the group uh, 
she got very excited about sharing about walking, walking in our neighborhood. Um, she pointed out all the points of interest, the beautiful gardens, um, her favorite shops, and um, getting to talk to other people, other neighbors while doing it, the birds, um, and just how much, how great it made her feel. And uh, so, so that was really fun to hear how excited she was about that. Um, and then another group member, um, she talked about how she really likes, instead of getting on an airplane um, to go on vacation, just to try to find some local spots that she hasn't been to before. So she shared like all the parks, um, camping and hiking spots and other local places that, um, that are not so far away and yet you, you feel relaxed and you can enjoy the beauty of these places. Um, and then there's this, um, my next door neighbor actually, uh, he's a train buff, I never knew. Um, but he has taken many, many trips by train and um, it saves a lot of energy compared to flying and he talked about the train trip not being just about the destination, but it's more about the adventure itself. So we each got inspired um, by these different stories that people were telling us in our group and we started thinking about our neighborhood and travel in a whole different way and, um, and just about how to get out of your car you know, and, and how you can walk and bike and take public transit um, more often. Great, thanks for sharing that. The, the travel piece is one of my favorite parts of Transition Street, so I'm glad you brought that up. And finally, over to you, Janet. All right, well, I kept trying to think and I thought it's so hard to pick out a single story. It's more, it's easier to talk about the vibe um, and the environment of gleaning. I just, I, one of my favorite things about gleaning is just really focusing on the relationships with the people that come to glean. I know that the produce is going to go be picked up by all face food banks and be distributed to people in need. And I know that the gleaners are going to have produce that they, that they take home. But to me, one of the most critical parts is just developing those relationships, asking how they're doing. On a, we have people that come every week and we have people that we only see um, once during the season. But over the entire season, we might see 250 people and 20 of those might be really routine volunteers. So it's a great experience to get to know people and help them help them connect with, with the environment and help them connect with each other. Thank you. Oh, my heart is feeling full right now. It was really inspiring to hear from each of you. Um, and now we're gonna get real about some of the challenges you've encountered um, in your projects, or if you like, you could also tell us a little bit about the direction you see your project evolving in the future again in just a minute. Um, and so we're gonna start this round with Tabita. All right, I will talk a little bit about how our project is evolving because we just started planning our second annual Winnishik Idea House and it's scheduled for February 23rd, 2019 if you wanna join the party. Um, one thing that we're gonna do differently this year is to have a couple of events with interested local entrepreneurs leading up to the final selection of the pitchers. Um, and also just to make, have more of an offering for local entrepreneurs. We're a small community of only, so the county has 20,000 people. Um, and so we just wanna make sure that we make it valuable for entrepreneurs as well in other ways. And so we just really wanna to get to know them better, provide feedback throughout the process and also give them a feel for what they ex they'll experience at Trout Tank. We also hope to collaborate more with the colleges in our county this year um, and make them part of the event in different ways. And finally, we also plan to follow up with our entrepreneurs from the first event and see you know, specifically what impact that event had on their business uh, so that we can track that over time. Wonderful. Um, Linda, you're up next. So the, the biggest challenge is, is really just keeping the momentum going. And, you know, you, you start the projects. It, Transition Streets is just really kind of a starting place for a lot of things. Um, but to keep them going, you know, it can be difficult. The Bay Area, so, you know, we have not 20,000. We have 110,000 in, in Berkeley alone. Um, so people are busy. 
Um, but I've noticed that just afterwards, since we did the program, um, there's been a lot more interaction, uh, a more, more stopping to say hello, more socializing, more sharing of tools. In fact, my neighbor came over just yesterday to borrow a tool from me. Um, and the, a great thing that came out of this was our commitment was to start um, our disaster plans. You know, we live in California and you've probably heard other places where we're having these terrible droughts and fires and we have, you know, threat of earthquake and other things. So, um, so we got together and we gathered information. We got together twice last year and we're planning another meeting soon. Um, several people took classes that the city offers. So it's, it's, it was a really good start and I'm very happy about that. Um, me, I personally um, would like to see more transition streets um, happen in, in our city and I think our group will be talking to our city council members. We have some new ones coming up and um, we may offer a few uh, transition streets uh, groups this coming year. Um, I'm also working with Transition US uh, on a household water conservation booklet and um, I'm excited about that. That'll be coming out in the new year. So look forward to that. Thank you. And thanks for mentioning the emergency preparedness piece as well. Um, Transition US is also working on a kind of a companion handbook to Transition Streets that's focused on emergency preparedness called Ready Together. Um, and so you'll all be able to learn more about that soon. Great, and now over to you, Janet. All right, well, one of the exciting things I think that we're gonna see in our future with the Gleaning Project is working with residents who have fruit trees. So we have in Florida, a lot of people have mangoes in their yards, mango trees in their yards, um, star fruit trees in their yards, some fruit trees that produce a lot of fruit, but it's difficult for the owners to necessarily manage the quantity being produced by the tree or necessarily be able to access the higher branches. So we're gonna be buying some, some equipment to allow us to get up to the higher branches in the tree and starting to engage more of the community in, on that scale. And so that's gonna be, be pretty fun. I love that. That sounds like a great solution. I just witnessed the implosion of an old apple tree in my community that wasn't cared for and was producing a lot of fruit. So I love to hear about that. Um, and let's close with you, Ginkgo, for this round. Yes, I think um, with the Repair Cafe, the biggest challenge is the ongoing administrative duties. It doesn't sound like a lot, but a lot of times uh, these community projects do have a lot of different pieces and communications that had to happen. So um, it, it has been a co constant challenge. So um, in, in our situation, I think I'm blessed with the characteristic, I'm not a very capable person. So I asked for help. Um, and since Repair Cafe does have its own energy, it's a very good project that people love it. So, uh, uh, over the last two, three years, uh, um, we have more people to step up to become a team that we kind of own the project equally. Um, I think that is something very important. And also personally, I feel that I learned a new way of being in an organization, which is uh, very flat, non-hierarchical. And how do we get uh, people together and invested in the project so that uh, not one person get burned out. So um, I think that's the biggest challenge and then uh, biggest things that um, I feel we can learn from the project. So right now I go to another country starting graduate program and only one person. So starting the process again to build out the team and um, I feel that um, being able to work on this really flat weight would, would help me. So we'll see. And um, we are going to have the first repair cafe in Tainan really soon in October. And I, I will see how the different culture would play out in getting a team and work together. So that's, that. thank you. Thank you. And I appreciate you speaking to the organizational dynamics because that's 
often some of the hardest but most important and maybe least appreciated, least focused on aspects of our work. So thanks for bringing that up. All right, so we have just five minutes left. I'd like to do a quick closing round and invite um, you all to share any last words of advice you have for folks who are interested in replicating a project like yours in their community. And this time we're gonna start with you, Linda. Okay. Um, yeah, I, I recommend um, going to the Transition Streets org website it's really fun and it's great and you'll be inspired just by going there all the materials are readily available um, there's even materials for facilitation and all the chapters are there everything's there that you need so start there and and see if it might be something you want to try in your neighborhood and then find a buddy um, I find it's very daunting when you think about doing something alone so if you already have a transition group or you have a neighborhood group or emergency preparedness group, uh, find somebody that, that might also be interested and go through the program with them. And give yourself a few months. Uh, when I worked on the pilot, um, I actually, it, it took me a while to uh, get people interested. I went door to door. I had a short letter describing what the pro project was and um, and then people didn't get back to me. And so then I went door to door <laughs> again and, and I got about 10 people, maybe 12 people interested. And then I said, well, let's just come over to my house and I'll explain it to you there. And then a few people dropped out. They're like, oh, I'm too busy. I can't do it. And then other people were like, yeah, this is exactly what I want to do. Um, good times of the year to do it are January, early in the new year, before spring, before everyone gets super busy. Um, you can meet, there's seven sessions that you meet, so you can meet uh, once a week, which we did because we had to get through pretty quickly for the pilot purpose. But you could meet twice a month, you can meet once a month. You could just take one chapter a season, if you like, whatever works for your group. And I, rec I recommend making it festive, like have some refreshments, have a little time to socialize. Rotate the meeting locations if you can, if people are willing rotate facilitators and encourage people that maybe are a little bit more shy to step up. Um, you, don't, you don't need to be perfect. It's, um, you know, it's a group process. Try to stay in touch in between the meetings, if you can, by email. And don't be upset if people miss meetings. That's life. Um, you can still continue. Everything can be fine. People can do stuff offline. Um, make sure you stay very positive, always. Um, this program is just a guide, so there's really nothing, there's no wrong, right or wrong. Um, just do it and, and enjoy the process. That's it. Thank you, Linda. <laughs> um, over to you, Janet, and we have just a couple minutes, so feel free to make it brief. Yeah, well, I think the main thing is is check out if gleaning is already happening. I would say one of the biggest gleaning organizations is called the Society of St. Andrew. So check them out, see if they're already in your area. Otherwise, talk to some of your local farmers. Great, thank you. And Ginkgo? So a lot of people like to do repair cafe, but afraid that they don't have money or resources. But the secret is that all you need is people. So you have your volunteers, they will bring their tools. Then you have a wonderful free event and a lot of old local organization would donate their space for you. Voila, you have the three elements to do repair cafe. So just do it, you can. Great, I love that encouragement. And finally, over to Tabita. Yeah, I think the top thing I would advise is to just nurture community relationships. Um, we were fortunate to be working with the economic development group and uh, even a locally owned bank showed up. So you, you never know where you're going to find allies in your projects and be open. And uh, like Ginkgo said, just do it. That's kind of the only way to go. <laughs> yeah, good luck. Thank you. Well, with that, we'll bring this very rich and inspiring session to a close. Um, for those of you in the audience who are inspired by what you heard and want to get started bringing one of these projects to your own community, 
You can learn more by getting a copy of our new publication, 10 Stories of Transition in the U.S., which includes stories featuring the Suncoast Gleaning Project, the Repair Cafe, and Transition Streets. And then you can also stay tuned for a webinar um, featuring the Winnishik Idea House, hopefully coming in 2019. We'll also be sending out an email to everyone who registered for the online summit with more info and resources to help you get started. And of course, you can always email info at transitionus.org with questions. I really want to thank each of our speakers for the important work you're doing in your own communities and for making time to join us today, taking time out of your busy schedules to share your stories and inspire others to bring these wonderful projects to their own communities. And with that, enjoy the rest of the online summit. Thanks, everyone. Thank you.